This is the crux of macroeconomics today. It's all about expectations. Expectations determine your behavior. Okay, everybody, welcome back. This is uh, lecture number eight. Today's topic is um, a continuation of the last one in the terms of money and money demand. And we'll also move into this new area of uh, thinking about the future, which is a, a, a fairly important unifying motive or um, objective in macroeconomics is to think about the future and the way it impacts on current decisions. And an uh, important um, way of thinking about macroeconomics is understanding how expectations are formed. This is going to be like a, an entree into thinking about expectations. And I'm going to use the hyperinflation model of Kagan to think about uh, this question. So this is a... And I'm trying to go lighter on the models, uh, but each, each one of these models is kind of like a milestone in the way we think. So the Kagan model, I've, I've seen students uh, 20 years later, and I've been here long enough to see students who remember this, and they can still think about this, because this is something that Germans care about. Germans care about inflation. They care about hyperinflation, and there's a good reason for that. And uh, we'll see later on how this hooks into the discussion of the demand for money. You know, we, had, we were able to convince ourselves last week that economic agents were willing to use worthless paper as a way of transforming resources today into resources in the future, conditional on not having any resources in their old age. So overlapping generations is a, is a very convincing explanation of how you can use assets to, to move consumption across time. But also, even if these assets are inherently worthless, people still use them. And that's explaining a lot of what we do today. We're using bank balances, literally ledger entries at banks uh, to pay for our rent, get our salary, uh, build bridges, pay for uh, all sorts of government expenditure. We could be using Bitcoin. We could be using uh, literally pieces of paper. But we use right now we use bank accounts. So it's just another way of uh, socially converging on a, on a convention. So money as gazelle noted is also about social conventions, not just um, gold or silver, okay? Um, so let's move uh, forward. Last lecture, I'll just re recapitulate. I'll try to motivate the Kagan model in terms of what we did last week. So using the overlapping generations model for money, and I'll show you the implication uh, this model has for expectations and the formation of expectations is crucial for understanding how economies get moving. So I'll give you some historical examples of how uh, people's expectations of the future had an impact on their behavior today regarding the price level and the demand for money. That's the, what we did, derived last time. The demand for money is still around. We still talk about it in economics. I think Kagan, in its extre extreme form, basically gives you the uh, understanding why we should never take our eye off the ball of money. Okay, so even though we, we, log, we like to talk about central bank policy, policy in terms of interest rates, ultimately the central bank controls the supply of money through its control over the banking system, which controls the um, extension of credit. And to the extent the central bank can still control that, it actually has, has some control over the inflation rate. And if it loses control of the inflation rate, we have situations that we see again and again in developing countries and in some developed countries. So to get beyond that, we need to understand how inflation gets started. And I'll try to motivate that with the discussion of the Phillips curve. So we're going to take, take you back to the 1950s again. We've been spending a lot of time in the 1950s. Um, there's a reason for that, because economics is not a moving average of short-lived uh, theories. It's actually if you look at the Nobel Prize winners of the past 50 years, it's been 50 years now, they're all very important names even today. Okay, so there is a, a, a legacy of ideas in economics, and you should keep that in mind. And one of these is the Phillips curve. Okay, so the Phillips curve has had some good times and some bad times, and it's back. Uh, we need to understand why it's back and how it helps us in macroeconomics. Before I get into the details, I'd like to tell you that tomorrow I have to do some advertising for myself. I've been asked to give the Nobel Prize lecture, which doesn't mean I'm getting the Nobel Prize. It means I'm going to tell you why in 2018 
uh, William Nordhaus and Paul Romer got the Nobel Prize. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be in German. This is part of our public relations uh, business. So we have a lot of people who might give us money, and most of those people don't speak English at the present. Maybe when you guys get out there and make your millions, you can give us money too. Okay. So if you speak German, please come. If you don't, please come and practice and ask me questions afterwards. Okay. I'm going to talk about why these two people got the Nobel Prize and why I think it was deserved. And some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about are actually in this course. Okay, so the solo model assumes exogenous technical progress. Romer's path-breaking work was to show that economics can explain why technical progress can be endogenous. Okay, and if you understand technical progress as being the advancement of ideas, that technical progress uh, is like an externality. It's a public good. An invention is a public good which gives rise to new public goods which can help us. If we understood the first one, we can understand the second one and we can build on these, on these successive advancements of knowledge. And that's a great way to understand what little a is in the solo model, even though solo took a shortcut and assumed it was exogenous. We know it changes very slowly. And right now it seems to be growing slowly, but maybe um, it'll grow fast again depends on what happens um, in this world of developing ideas. So we develop new cures for cancer, or we develop new ways to teleport ourselves to other places. Uh, this could certainly have a lot of influence on the way the economy behaves. Last time we looked at the cast ramsey koopmans model again. It's not just the Ramsey model, but I, we call it the Ramsey model for short. Um, and then we jumped into this notion of money. So the rest of today is about money and money and inflation. And we're going to build on these insights we had last time. So if you, if you missed the lecture, go watch the movie, um, the rerun, because it's important. Because we talk about why we use it and how it matters. Even if it's worthless, we can still use it. If it's worthful or worth something, we can still use it. But we could also use uh, worthless uh, trinkets or tokens to, to generate intergenerational or more general types of exchange. It doesn't have to be intergenerational. So the, those of you who are like fancy, like to think about economic questions, you can compress the intertemporal aspect into a spatial aspect and think about this as a way of uh, solving the double coincidence of wants across space. Okay, so it's, it's a very general problem. And then we talked about how to introduce money, and I mentioned several different attempts and approaches, the most important being cash in advance and money in the utility function. So those are two standard ways of doing this. The, Money in the utility function is a cheap way of getting around the idea of having a Lagrange multiplier. Every time you want to spend some money, you got to have some money in your pocket or in your bank account. Okay, but nowadays we can actually attack those types of problems. They have very similar implications. So I'm not going to spend much time on this if you're interested and you want to do a PhD in economics. This is a, a very interesting question to think about. We talked about the implications of the simple OLG model for, for inflation, which was that when things have settled down, the rate of growth of money um, is correlated with uh, the rate of inflation, and it actually is causal for the rate of inflation, okay, to, to some extent. Okay, there's a possibility that people could have beliefs that the price of money will, um, of goods in terms of money, will rise at a constant rate that's divorced from the money supply, but that's called a, a speculative bubble. The fundamental determinant of the value of money is the supply of money in circulation in this model. Okay, so that's kind of an anchor for us. We know that in the short run, we'll have deviations from that. In modern macroeconomic models you'll do in, the, in other courses, you'll see that money is sort of like a, the tail of the dog. Um, we, we, we know it's there, we don't care about it very much, but um, in fact, if things get out of control, maybe we would, we would care about it again. And we also know that it has these long run properties. So that's kind of the way we think about things today. And we use the OLG model as a, as a teaching device to help us get to that point. And the lasting thing you should remember is that the, the OLG model predicts that the demand for money by young people will depend on their income and the rate of return on the money. And the rate of return on money is, in a sense, the comparison of money with alternative risk less or even risky assets that bear interest. Okay, so in a world where we don't have any other assets, you just have money, 
It's the rate of deflation, which can be negative. If you have inflation, the rate of deflation is negative. So the demand for money will depend negatively on the rate of inflation or positively on the rate of deflation. And that's an important insight. So when inflation is high, people are going to be trying to get rid of their money. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, if, in, if deflation is low, then people will be kind of indifferent between holding money and holding interest-bearing uh, bank accounts or other types of assets. Those assets are not in the OLG model, so we can't really talk about them, but you can imagine what kind of trade-off the individual would have to face. Okay, so let's go back to a modern world now. We're not in the OLG world. We've got this modern system of money, and then I want you to think about where the money is again. This is very important. Um, you know, we, we learn accounting in economics because we want to understand what accountants do. Just like Ro Joan Robinson said, we should learn economics so that economists don't fool us. We need to understand the way accounting works so accountants don't fool us. Um, money is a product of double entry bookkeeping. So it's somebody's asset and somebody's liability. And in the OLG model, we only talked about it as an asset. It was an outside asset. You should write that down. Outside asset means it's kind of coming from, from heaven. Okay. Money in the, the modern world is an inside asset. Every asset is somebody else's liability in the system. We don't use gold anymore. We don't use seashells. We don't use, some people may use Bitcoin, but it's kind of uh, off, the, off the map right now. Um, it's basically a double entry bookkeeping system. So we're gonna be talking about, you know, even if governments are increasing the volume of money in circulation and it's being multiplied up by some banking system, it's still part of this double entry system, and this is called inside money. You know, some people even call the central bank's money uh, inside money. Uh, the purists would say, no, it's created out of thin air. So let's just kind of just call this um, double entry bookkeeping, because even if it's outside money from the perspective of the banking system that's not the central bank, it's certainly a liability of the central bank as well as being the asset of the public. So look carefully at that and understand your masters. You should understand inherently what this is trying to tell you. The banking system is part of the monetary system. The central bank cannot create all the money itself. It creates uh, reserves for the commercial banks that back up their lending that they do to the public. Most of what we hold in terms of money is actually deposits. So giro konten, you know, Buchgeld, Giralgeld, okay? Reserves, um, well, reserve accounts as they, they call them in the UK or checking accounts as they're called in the United States, okay? So uh, this is important. Uh, just keep that in mind because later on we'll, we'll start talking about macro in a more complicated way. And you should always remember the banking sector is not just the central bank, it's not just the ECB. If the central bank thrusts reserves into the craw of the banking system, it may not lend it. We may have the situation we have now. So it's the banking system as a whole. It's also the banks, the private banks like the Deutsche Bank and the Commerzbank and, and the Sparkas. And if they don't want to lend or if people aren't borrowing from them, the money supply will not have the same volume than it would under normal conditions. Okay, so keep that in mind. Assets and liabilities, double entry. Okay, so what did we learn last time? We learned that fiat money is a rational uh, artifact of a trading society and will be demanded even in a, just a simple intergenerational context if agents believe they can use it in the future. So old people uh, have made a bet that when they were young, they could trade some of their income for pieces of paper that they could actually exchange for real live consumption that makes them happy Money doesn't make them happy in the classic OLG model. You don't get happiness from holding the money. You get happiness from buying something with it. Um, therefore, the demand for money is a derived demand. It's derived from utility maximization, and it's a, it's a function of those two things. So in the old-fashioned tobin uh, Baumol model that we learned in, in college, um, the, money, um, the demand for money, real balances, was a function of income, GDP, and is a function of the interest rate and the Income, income has a positive sign, a positive effect on the demand for money, and interest rates have a negative effect because it's the opportunity cost of holding money in this non-interest-bearing form. Okay, 
So keep that in mind. We come, we'll come back to that in a second. Okay. If you have other assets, it's still there because money is depreciating at the rate of inflation. If, if, if inflation is positive and if it's, the price level is falling, it has a rate of return. And if you have other assets, they compete with money. Money has the liquidity advantage. You can't pay for uh, things using treasury bills in Germany. Um, you can't pay for a house with treasury bills that, you, that the government issues for, for financing its debt, a deficit, um, but you can convert that into cash, and bank accounts, and pay for your house, or pay for your apartment, pay for your car, um, with that kind of uh, stuff. Okay, so this convenience, this liquidity convenience can also explain why people hold money at all, right? That's the whole OLG logic. Okay, so money's own return, negative inflation rate, even if you take the nominal interest rate, subtract uh, the real rate on, on assets, uh, if you subtract those two, two nominal rates of return on, on money and other assets, you're going to get something like the inflation rate. So money demand is a function of the price of goods in terms of money tomorrow. Okay, so that's the expectations. The key that gives us the expectations insight is that to get um, an inflation expectation, inflationary expectation into your decision, you have to have a view about the price of goods and services in terms of the money and monetary unit tomorrow. And we don't know what that's going to be. It's a random variable. Okay, so I mean, as much as I think I understand how the German economy works, I can't rule out that inflation over the next year might be 4%. We think it's going to be maybe under 2%. And that's probably what most countries on average in the European Monetary Union are going to expect in the next year. But in some countries it might be less, like in Greece. In some countries, like in Ireland, it'll be more. Right? So these are things that we have to expect. And if you're working for a living, your wages that you contract for for the next year are kind of depending on how well you get that right. So if you get that wrong, you think inflation is going to be low, and then you get surprised by inflation, you've made a bad deal and you can't change it until next time. So that's, that's why inflation and expectations of inflation is so important for our economic system because it also conditions people's borrowing behavior, and it conditions people's purchasing behavior, etc. So today we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about how inflation gets started. And it's, it's only the beginning of a very long voyage because we've only talked about the long run we think monetary growth has to do with that long run. So how does, how does the central bank get, uh, get into the situation where they're just creating lots of money? Okay, so it's a fascinating question. Why would, why would the Turkish central bank or the Argentine central bank over the past 25 years create so much money? Right, I mean, it's expensive. When Bolivia had its big hyperinflation in 1984-85, the largest import item was printed monetary instruments, banknotes. Because the Bolivians didn't know how to print them themselves, so they imported them from Germany, from Switzerland. It's kind of crazy, right? Why would a country get into that, that kind of situation? So ask that question and try to answer it before we get there. Because if you can answer that question, maybe we'll have some beat on, uh, on why inflation gets started. And we're going to use lots of history. To, we're going to look at the German hyperinflation. We're going to look at the Bolivian case. We're going to look at uh, Bulgaria in the 1990s. There's some, you know, some marginal instances of, of, of inflation. People like to call it hyperinflation, but we have a special definition for it. 50% per month, which is a pretty high bar. 50% per month is the Kagan definition of hyperinflation. So imagine if the price of everything in the stores and the bars and the restaurants, the clubs, and your wages were rising at a rate like that. What, what chaos you could imagine uh, the world being like. Well, you know, you don't have to look very far. There are places on this earth right now that are going through this situation. So it's not like ancient history. It's like it can happen again and again. So we need to understand. And we also need to understand how to stop it. And one of the keys to stopping it is to get people's anticipations of the future price level under control. Okay, so this is the, the trick to solving Bolivia's problem in 1984-85 was uh, inherently related to trying to get people's expectations. And the inherent secret to the Weimar uh, Republic's ability to stop the hyperinflation in 1923 was changing people's expectations. Okay, so if you like economic history, this is going to be great for you. 
Um, we don't pay much attention to money anymore. I said that already. I just want to say that again. In many courses you'll take here, money plays a residual role, the stock of money. Even though money is the grease that oils the, the mechanism that, that, you know, that makes life easy for all of us. So we usually, it's like, the, it's like plumbing. We don't really notice uh, that it's there until it fails. Okay, so if we, if we go to Zimbabwe, we have a failure. People don't accept the Zimbabwe dollar. Even though they had a hyperinflation, they stopped it. And now they're printing money again and people don't trust them. So you have this problem of trust, right? So it's when the, when the plumbing breaks, when the kanisation nicht mehr funktioniert, you know, then you have a problem. You, you notice it. So we will pay attention to money when it becomes a problem. But right now we think of in a, in a low inflation environment like the central bank, uh, the European Central Bank, or the, or the Bank of England, or the United States, the, Central, the Fed, the Swiss National Bank, they, they're able to, to maintain control of the system by just fixing the interest rate, the nominal interest rate, changing the conditions by which banks can borrow reserves. But ultimately, in the background, there is always this knowledge that many civilized countries have gone through hyperinflation before. Okay, and this is part of what John Taylor gave us. So if you took my course or Lutz Weinke's course, you know what the Taylor rule is. John Taylor, also up, on, up for grabs for Nobel Prize at some point, basically discovered that central banks uh, use the interest rate in a very uh, proactive way to fight inflation and to keep the economy on track. And um, basically, if, if countries and central banks adhere to these stable rules, inflation tends to be pretty stable. Okay, so if you take the class of OECD countries, for the most part, over the past 50 years, you have a, a situation where this type of logic works. You can just ignore uh, money, okay? And Michael Woodford, who's also a very important person contributing to this so-called New Keynesian macroeconomics, um, has basically said, you can track money, like I said, the tail of the dog, who cares? Cut it off, it's, the dog's gonna be okay. Um, you, you know, as long as you don't, as long as you don't let things get out of control, things are gonna be okay. And we're gonna show you that, you know, if we're not careful, we still have to pay attention, and most, most, mostly about paying attention to inflation. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind. Later on in the course, we'll, talk, we'll come back to this. Uh, thinking about inflation as, a, as an indicator, it's like the canary in the coal mine. If, if inflation gets out of control, then we know the central bankers are not, not, they don't have their eye on the ball anymore. Okay, maybe it's a secret they have a higher inflation target than they're telling you. So the Taylor logic assumes that central banks fix a target rate of inflation and they stick to it and they don't lie to the public. Okay, so my, many of you come from countries that are not equal to Germany or the United States or England and you know what I'm talking about. There are countries where inflation has picked up even though the central banks are telling you how great their a job they're doing. Okay, so again, believe uh, the data if you can, and then make your judgment from that point going forward. Someone has a question. Yes. How do you define inflation getting out of hand? Because I was arguing that a lot of people would say it gets out of hand way before we reach the state of hyperinflation. We'll see it. Uh, just, just, just be patient. But one thing, one thing we've talked about consistently is the steady state. What does a steady state mean? Something's constant. In growth, it means the growth rate is constant or the capital labor ratio is constant, or uh, some other indicator which is central is constant. So steady state in our money, money economy, OLG economy, was a constant inflation rate. Okay, so that should be a guiding force. And later on we'll have that as a steady state condition. Stable inflation. Under what conditions can we have stable inflation? Inflation is not rising secularly. Okay, and I'll show you a case where inflation has been rising secularly, okay, and that's obviously not a steady state. Okay, so we want to we want to restrain our um, constrain our view to, to situations where things are steady. Okay, so inflation has to stop rising. Okay, that's kind of what uh, Milton Friedman also used as a way of of defining the natural rate of, of unemployment. Same same sort of logic. So let's get into that model now. Okay, let's. This is uh, there are two types of Kagan model. I'm I'm actually sparing you a lot of grief. I could be doing this in a much more detailed way, but I think there are two ways of looking at the Kagan model. One is discrete time and one is continuous time. I'd like to do both 
The continuous time has a beautiful sort of, it reminds you what the logarithm does. Small changes in the logarithm are like percentage changes. And then we'll move to the continuous form, and that will remind you of the, of the Ramsey model again. Okay, so we'll have a nice little retour, and then it'll be the last time you ever see a continuous time model. Okay. I'm delighted that so many people here, by the way, vielen Dank. Yeah, it's just, it warms my heart to have such great attendance, even though we have a, the filmed version coming up, upcoming soon. Okay, so hyperinflation is a reason to pay attention to money. Okay, there are a lot of historical examples of hyperinflation. And our OLG model tells us this must have something to do with the rate of growth of money. So the key to understanding hyperinflation, and that's what Kagan taught us in the 1950s, was that it has to do with the behavior of the central bank. Okay? It's a recurrent problem in mostly developing countries, but Germany was a very developed country in 1920, 21, 22, and it had the same issue. Okay? Italy was a developed country in 1946. Hungary was a developed country in, in the 1950s. It's a great demonstration of how money demand works, and the reason I teach this is because I want you to remember it. Okay, and finally, the role of expectations means that it's not easy to beat inflation. You cannot just sort of get up like Erdogan in Turkey says, inflation, I decree it to be, no, to be zero, okay? That's not gonna work. People aren't gonna listen to you because their livelihood depends on what they can do with their money in the next period. And if they believe that it's losing value, they're gonna spend it. Okay, so it's kind of a logical, you have to convince people using uh, the tools that convince them and their expectations of future inflation uh, to go, to, to go uh, down. So it's about credibility. And we're going to talk about what drives those inflation expectations in a second. So let's look at the data for Germany. This is Germany in 1922. In 1923, and, and the situation that led up to this is, um, is well known. I'm not going to comment on it too much, but Germany had a large, uh, you know, suffered a very large uh, reparations demand, uh, which caused it to, to move into a deficit. It had to actually borrow money to finance the uh, reparations payments. And eventually, the people started to get upset. They started to go on strike and, and, and do all sorts of other things. And that led for the government to basically um, start using deficits finance to pay for this. But let's look at this, just look at the raw data to see how, how extreme the situation was. So these, the first two columns are indexes setting January 22 equals one. And in October 23 is the price level, okay, based on that January 22 observation. So this is collected by a, a Berlin a scholar by the name of Hod Freirich at the Free University. He's, this is very, very old work that he did, going through you know, old documents that um, are all dusty and stuff, and actually writing down these numbers and computing um, the first column is the, the external value of the, of the Reichsmark, of the German currency unit. Second one is a price level using a basket of prices, sort of usual the spare index of prices. And the third one is the rate of change of that index, okay, per month. Okay, so you can see that these numbers get quite, quite high. So it's pretty outrageous, you know. These are, these are extreme situations. So again, if you believe the monetary model uh, this is about money creation, so why in the world would the Reichsbank create money like that unless they were forced to do so? Because central banks are conservative people. You know, even the women that go into the, into the central banks tend to be very conservative. So they're not, this is not something they want to do. It's not just a bunch of old men. It's about old conservative people who are forced to do things that they, that they normally wouldn't want to do. Okay. These are some wonderful pictures of the, of the era, which remind you how bad it was. Okay, so on the right, uh, you have kids playing with blocks of money, uh, which are worthless, basically. They're not worth the money they're printed on. On the left, you have women using, or a woman using uh, the old devalued Reichs, Reichsmark banknotes for fuel to heat the apartment or to start up the fire, probably. And then, um, kind of amusing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lower left, a kid made a kite um, out, of a, out of some banknotes. On the right, they're just probably making, uh, making Christmas cards or something. In any case, the, the interesting thing is, if you look at the denomination, um, eine billion in, in, in English is a trillion. So it's a million million. This is like the, 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 
the end of the, of the road, this is the very end of the hyperinflation, and the, underneath you notice the, the, the postage stamp um, of 50, 30 billion um, Reichsmark for a postage stamp for probably sending a normal mail um, postage, uh, you know, letter in the mail. These are stamped, so the, the actual, the printing was done separate from the stamping, so the post office would actually stamp the denomination on the, on the, on the uh, postage stamp. Um, there are other exotic uses. Uh, one of the classic signs of hyperinflation is when you start using uh, physical, you know, tra you have transport of, the, of your salary is an issue. Not just uh, physically getting a sore back, but also not getting attacked and, and, and robbed. Right, so you you know, here's you have you have some people that are being accompanied through through the street with some um, probably some some protection just to make sure people don't try to steal steal the banknotes and, and spend them. And on the left you have a, a storage facility where they're uh, getting ready to dispense the stuff. Okay, so uh, this was a serious problem. We see it today. Um, Zimbabwe ten years ago had a hyperinflation. Um, I got this from one of my students. This is a this is an example of scrip because they, the, the Zimbabweans couldn't even afford to pay for their banknotes, so they had to actually have certain employers print the money and use it to pay their employees. So the way you get into circulation, I mean, the central bank just gives away part of its, its, guilt, its uh, money production, uh, just outsources it to various important agents uh, like this agro uh, facility. I mean, it's, it's basically printed for the reserve bank of Zimbabwe, okay? So with that $50 billion Zimbabwe dollar banknote, you could buy three, um, or actually you could probably buy two thirds of an egg, okay? Because that says three for, for 100 billion. Okay, so Philip Kagan in the 1950s looked at these situations that already involved, German hyperinflation was seen as the cause of the, the fall of the Weimar Republic because the middle class was wiped out. Inflation is not good. Because people who save and don't pay much attention to speculation, they, they tend to lose a lot. So the middle class got wiped out in Germany, and this gave rise to all the things that happened afterwards. So Philip Kagan um, was not a historian, but he was very interested in these historical instances, instances of hyperinflation. And he basically wrote his thesis on this. And his uh, dissertation was about the monetary dynamics of hyperinflation. And it, part of it appeared in Milton Friedman's famous volume on the quantity um, theory of money in 1956, okay? And um, this continues to be, and I urge you to read it. We'll put it online. It's a very, very interesting paper. It's very easy to read. It has some pretty primitive ideas about how inflation expectations evolve, but that was the way we think about it, and that's the way we still kind of think about it. Uh, it's a fairly robust a uh, way of modeling inflation expectations because people don't have hyper-rationality. They kind of need to be convinced. So maybe they're using Bayesian learning or some sort of learning procedure that looks like autoregressive expectations. It looks like they're just making recourse to the past. And it's a convenient modeling strategy. And uh, his data are also very good. So if you'd like to look at the data, uh, check out the book. So I'm gonna start with a discrete time version of this, which looks a lot like what we did last week a log linearized version, and I think uh, Andreas talked about this in the section, log linearization, or a model where you get a nice closed form money demand function, okay, sort of fraction of your income, unit elasticity of money demand uh, with respect to income and a semi-elasticity of maybe one or something, okay? So we're just gonna take logarithms of that money demand function or take a log linear approximation and just Think of it like this, okay? So the log of the left-hand side is the log of m over p at time t. So it's kind of a race between the nominal money supply or money demand and the price level. Here we're talking about money demand, so it's a race between the nominal money demand and the price level we can observe today, which is useful for you when you want to buy your goods. And then you've got on the right-hand side the determinants of that unit elasticity with respect to income. So 1% increase in GDP or your income would increase your demand for real money by 1%. Okay, and the eta, this Greek character is basically, or symbol is the semi-elasticity of money demand with respect to the interest rate. Okay, so that's positive. Negative sign means it's a negative relationship, so the interest rate goes up by 
one percentage point, then the demand for money goes down by new, sorry, eta percentage points. That's an eta. Okay? So if we use small letters to denote lo natural logarithms, it makes, it makes our life easier. We have to write ln. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> um, it looks like that. So it's linear. Okay, this is going to help us. And then we're going to add our knowledge of the Fisher equation. What is the Fisher equation? The Fisher equation is a definition of the real interest rate put on its head. It says basically that the nominal interest rate is the sum, a peu près, approximately, the real interest rate plus the inflation rate. Okay? Everybody who has a master, everyone who has a bachelor should know what the Fisher equation is, okay? Because it's the real interest rate, is the one you really have to pay. If everything else is, if prices and wages are going up by the inflation rate, then you don't want to pay attention too much to the nominal interest rate because it's kind of reflecting that uh, loss of value and l lenders will not ignore that. They will ask for higher interest rates. So over long periods of time, the inflation rate gets embedded into the nominal interest rate, okay? Now, if you take that into consideration, that means we can write the nominal interest rate as the sum of a real interest rate, R, which I'm just gonna take as given and constant, plus the inflation rate that's expected. And using the logarithmic approximation that's equal to little p, t plus one, expected, minus pt. Okay, that's a logarithmic approximation of the forward-looking inflation rate. Okay? So you should all know how to do this, right? This is all baby, baby economics. But now I'm going to take first differences. I'm going to difference that. I'm going to get exactly what Kagan is trying to tell us. Okay? The first difference of money demand in logarithms depends on the growth of GDP or income, and it depends on the change in interest rates. Change in interest rates. So if interest rates are constant, then the real interest rate is constant, and the inflation rate that's expected is constant, and that's how I defined a steady state. Okay? So anytime delta i is non-zero, we're changing. We're moving to some new, new place. So think about Venezuela interest rates are probably still going up. Think about Turkey. Interest rates are still going up because the central bank is chasing uh, the inflation rate, trying to cool down the economy, the borrowing, the capital flight. Okay? So if I just plug in IT, I actually get the change in the interest rate, which is assumed to be zero because it's a constant, and we've got this changing inflation rate. So I'm going to come back to that equation in a second. Current money demand, obviously, is driven by future prices, future inflation. Okay? And this, this, this model of Kagan actually automatically embeds, incorporates the monetary neutrality proposition. So when things are steady, the rate of growth of prices, remember that's the change in the natural logarithm is an approximate form, approximate expression of the rate of inflation on the left hand side is a race between monetary growth and real growth. Okay. So already we have an interesting idea. You know, China has a, if you look at Chinese data, it's amazing. China has a huge growth in credit, huge growth of money supply, yet they don't have a hyperinflation. It's because their economy is growing like crazy. The Chinese economy is doubling in size between every seven and 10 years. It's the modern miracle. And if you come tomorrow, I will talk about that. It's one of the things that motivated Paul Romer to think about growth is the Chinese miracle. Okay, so future prices affect current demand for money. Current demand for money probably affects current price of money, the price of goods in terms of money. Okay, so it's kind of like a recursion. It's a bit hard to understand, but it means that expectations of the future impact the present. That's what makes macro so exciting, especially modern macro. We, we try to really get at this this circularity, this recursiveness, okay? So rising expectations of future inflation depress the demand for money today. 
how can it depress the demand for money today if the supply of money is kind of given by the suppliers of money, the central bank and the banking sector? Well, this means that current prices have to adjust. Okay, so for the demand for money to, to drop, equivalently people are spending money, they drive up the price of money, uh, the price of goods today in terms of money and that drives down the real money supplies. So that's exactly what we learned last week in the OLG Samuelson model, and you can see this in some interesting instances. So this is just one case that I managed to dig up um, about 10 years ago for my IAMA class when I was teaching it in German. Uh, this is really interesting. Look at this. This is Bulgaria. Bulgaria had kind of a semi-hyperinflation. It really wasn't uh, anything like Weimar Germany or uh, Zimbabwe or, or Venezuela, uh, but it, they had a spike of inflation for a few uh, quarters, which is quite, quite dramatic. And you, interesting, you see that people's demand for money, or the demand for money equaling supply, because it's a clearing market. Right? You can see it's already starting to drop before. People are already starting to, to anticipate uh, something to happen. And the spike in money, so money demand uh, in the downward direction coincides with the spike of inflation in the positive direction. And then they had some, something happen in Bulgaria in the late 1990s and people started to use money again. Okay, so the economy became reliquified, re if you like. Uh, prices started rising less rapidly than uh, the money supply and the, the M divided by P started to grow again. And that's what you see subsequent to 1996. Okay. So we need to understand people's expectations. What could have driven those Bulgarians to think the way they did uh, pre-1997 and what caused them to change their behavior afterwards? Okay, so the Kagan model gives us some very clear predictions on that. But we can also look at other instances. So I could show you some data from Bolivia. I could show you the Italian data post-war. Israel had a hyperinflation in 1986. Um, Russia, after the uh, collapse of uh, the USSR, Serbia, and of course Zimbabwe. And now we have these three new cases, which are kind of interesting. Argentina has a great track record for inflation. Um, uh, until the 1990s, inflation every decade was rising. Okay, and they've had several bouts of hyperinflation. Those guys know what inflation is. Okay, Turkey has also had some inflation. I'll show you. Um, and all these things, you know, we're coming to this new year, new excitement. Uh, new new uh, variation in the data, uh, it's all there. The thesis is that underlying all these hyperinflations is central bank financing government deficits. There's a lot of really good evidence of that. Okay, so the best example I can tell you recently was Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe um, had a um, couple of land reforms that were very uh, disastrous for the supply side. Okay, so you can you can be in favor of more equitable distribution of, of land, but if you take it away from the people who are producing, the only thing your country produces, and then production collapses, then you have a problem. So you have less output, you have less, dem you have less demand for money, you also have less tax revenues, the government has to pay its ci civil servants, and you know, Mugabe has lots of civil servants, loyal people in the army and the police force, and they expect their money, and if he can't raise taxes, and he can't borrow money on international credit markets, He's got to print it. It's really easy to understand. And he actually said it in public about four years before the hyperinflation. I have to print the money to pay my people. Okay, we have to be creative, he said. Okay. Zimbabwe is an incredibly rich country. And if you don't believe that, look at Zambia, which is the twin brother. Look at the, just go compare the data. I see you're all Googling right now, looking it up. Yeah, Zimbabwe. Yeah. Some of you are on the computer, it's great. Look it up, man, Zimbabwe. Yeah. Used to be British Rhodesia. So let's use, the, let's use the, the discrete model version, a few more slides to talk about this. Okay, so let's assume that the central bank, um, in this case, we're just gonna assume the central bank is dominant. There, there are two ways to do this. You can assume the central bank does what it wants, and then you can say, well, the central bank is being forced by, Zim by Zimbabwe's leader or by Venezuela's leader to extend finan credit finance and print money to, to, to actually uh, transfer those, those, um, that purchasing medium to the government. We're going to start just assuming the fiscal authority 
has nothing to do with this. So I'll take the easy case. So the central bank is loco. They just print lots of money. We'll see how that works. Okay? In that case, we talk about a dominant central bank behavior and a, a passive you know, sort of balanced uh, budget uh, fiscal authority. So you can see there are two things going on. You have a fiscal authority and you have a, a monetary authority, and they're kind of competing with each other possibly. So the easy one is when the central bank actually calls the shots. Okay, so the price level is endogenous, we already said that, and it depends, I will show that it now depends on the present and future monetary policy. Okay, so let's take this logarithm of money demand, um, take the convention we had, that we had before, take the equilibrium condition, and then plug in the first different, the, uh, the Fisher equation, and now I'm gonna say, let's ignore the real interest rate just to make it easy. So we'll just set R equals zero. In a hyperinflation, nobody cares about the real interest rate. You're, just comp you're trying to protect the purchasing power of your money. Okay, so you're running away from money, you're buying, you're building apartments, you're, you're buying gold, and you're, buy you're buying dollars. A lot of the economy has become, but it's running on foreign exchange anyway. You buy real estate. So if you do that, you get the money demand on the left-hand side now depends on, only on the inflation rate. Okay, so inflation rate goes up, money demand goes down. Money demand goes down um, in real terms only if the price level can go up. Okay, so it's endogenous. We can rewrite that equation. We can write the price level on the left-hand side as the outcome of two things. One is the current money supply, which is exogenous, and the expected price level tomorrow. All I've done is rearrange this last equation. Okay. So you can see we already have this dependence that I talked about before, except now it's in the level. The level of prices today depend on current money and the future expected level of prices tomorrow. Okay, that's a recursive relationship. If I lead that relationship by one period, I have PT plus one is a function of MT plus one, which is also added to, to that of, of a function of PET plus two. Okay, so in a sense I could take the second substitute it into the first, right? And I get a, um, a function of mt plus one, mt, and mt plus two. Okay, so just substituting would give me something like the following. I have a, a component that depends on the current observable money supply, and then I've got an expectation of money in the future, and I've got this expectation of prices in the, in the second period. Okay, so I could do this in you know, arbitrary number of times. Um, eta is greater than one, so that's gonna be like a geometric uh, series, or uh, the geometric series applied to M, so if M isn't exploding really, really fast, this thing will be actually well-defined. It may not. Maybe M, the crazy central bankers are increasing M really fast, faster than, say, eta, and that guarantees that nothing's gonna work. Okay, but in, let's just try to fix ideas and write down uh, the following formula. So I just recursively substitute many times, I'm gonna get the current price level as a future, is an expected discounted value using this kind of discount factor, which is a function of eta, um, as a function of today's money, which we can observe, and future expected money into the infinite future. This reminds me a little bit of the OLG model in a sense, it has to do with what people believe the future is going to be. In the OLG model, there are just two periods of life here. People are kind of looking into the infinite future because there's, everyone's living a long time here, and they're looking basically, uh, what do we think the central bank is going to do in 20 years or 10 years? And the weights are declining, so the, the powers of eta divided by one plus eta become irrelevant. Uh, but what, what matters is the next, say, five to 10 years. It's really important. And then you've got this tail. Okay, this is, the, this is like the, 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 the very long run. Okay, so if, you know, the, the, this is the basis of a, lot of, of a lot of pricing, asset pricing theory. Okay, we can call this first part the fundamental determinant of the price level, and this is kind of the non-fundamental. It's based on some expectation uh, over which we have no control. This is a solution to a difference equation, and solutions to difference equations have to have terminal conditions to pick one, because we have many different possible solutions. Many different expectations of that faraway price are consistent with that uh, 
equation that I wrote down in the previous slide. Okay, so this is kind of a, this is a conundrum for us because we'd like to rule out this one. We don't think the price level is gonna explode. We think it's gonna grow less rapidly than this discount, this, this pseudo discount factor, it's gonna disappear. So if I take the limit of the left-hand side as, t go, as capital T goes to infinity, the second term should disappear. So if we focus on the fundamental solutions of that difference equation, we only have this part. So the price level today, in a model where people have foresight over the money supply tomorrow and the next period, it's gonna depend on a weighted average of that future monetary policy. So we already have an explanation of Bulgaria, right? The Bulgarians are not stupid. They saw it coming. Liberalization, no money in, in, the, in the government uh, coffers, no goods in the stores, people are getting worried, they know the government's just gonna start printing money like crazy, and that's exactly what they did, and then prices exploded. I guess that's a nice explanation of the way the price today depends on not just today's money supply, but also expected future. It also explains why if a country has a financial crisis, okay, it means a big expansion of the money supply in one period, but with the expectation the money supply will be drawn back in the future periods, it shouldn't have an effect on the price level today because people don't expect it to be a permanent change in the money supply. Okay, so if you look at the data, after the financial crisis, a lot of forms of money did increase in ways that a lot of diehard monetarists were concerned about. But again, if you apply the, the Kagan model, this should be sort of smoothed over. It's only if the government's really gonna go for the printing press in the long run um, should you expect a permanent effect on prices. And the prices are forward looking so that this inflationary impact, as you move through time, you will have inflation. It will depend on the change in this weighted sum. Okay, so it's not just that prices jump today, but they will also continue to rise as a function of expected future monetary policy. So that's a really important equation. That's the solution to the difference equation. Recognizing that there's a potential bubble, if you think about this, this is a bubble because this element is kind of a f loose screw. We can assume anything about that. And if we just want to look at the fundamental assumptions, we're going to assume that this is equal to zero. As, as capital T goes to infinity, we impose that that thing, so it's like stock prices. You can use the same equation to, to value stock prices. Write down an equation that says the current stock price is a function of the dividend today plus the expected capital gain tomorrow. You can rec recursively solve that, you get the same formula, except it says that the current stock price has a fundamental part, which is the dividends, the income of the company, plus some future value of the stock in some faraway period. Now, again, a lot of people thought that Google was gonna, you know, just gonna change the world, but Google eventually did start to fall because people realized that Google's P, T plus one plus, plus little t is, it was, not, uh, was not as big as they thought. Okay, it wasn't growing because eventually things come to an end. So think of, this, think, of, think of this as the fundamental solution. The first term of this expression as the fundamental solution. And we need to understand what, ch what causes people's expectations to change. This is the fascinating part. Now we understand why the future expected monetary policy is just as important, in fact, possibly more important. If you look at the, if you look at the weights, the weight on the current money is small compared to this block of weights that are attached to future money. So if government can convince you that they're gonna cut the money supply growth rate or the money supply in the level, and it's credible, everyone believes it, then inflation can stop very quickly. And a lot of people think this is why the Weimar Republic was able to stop the hyperinflation in 1924, because they reformed the Reichsbank. They actually introduced a new bank that was not allowed to lend money to the government the Rentenbank, okay? So they had a new, big, it was like big marketing thing, new bank, new monetary policy, you know, independence from the government, and that actually had an effect. If you look at the data, inflation after 1924 was very low because they pegged it to gold. It's just a way of people convincing people it doesn't have to be gold, it could be Bitcoin. <laughs> they didn't have it back then. Uh, it could be the U.S. dollar. But they had to break people's expectations that the money supply growth rate would continue to increase. So everything we're going to do now 
is trying to understand those changes in expectations. Okay, so I'm gonna focus on fiscal deficits in the, in the last part of this lecture. I'm gonna focus on uh, the way the central bank gets kind of beaten up by the, the fiscal authority to make them lend money, uh, like Zimbabwe, uh, like Germany pre-reform. Uh, but it could also be other things, it could be a war. Like in Serbia and Croatia, they had a war, and you know, wars are expensive, maybe, they should make them pay for it with taxes. There wouldn't be any wars. Uh, but if you can get the printing press going, it's cheap to have a war. You, know, you can just pay people with, with these banknotes. And that's what Napoleon discovered when he founded the Bank of Bank, the Banque de France back in the day. Um, it's easy to raise money. You don't have to ask for any, any prevent, pr private fin financier to, to finance your war. So I'm going to focus on um, the deficit. But you can think about other things happening. You can think of... You know, when you get into a high inflation mode, it's hard to get people to pay taxes. People run away from you because they know if I can just pay in two months, it's worth a lot less, right? The money's worth less. If I can, if I can postpone my fiscal, you know, my uh, paying my taxes uh, for a year, then it's worth 50, 60, 70 percent, 100 percent less, right? A lot less. Okay. So you can have other things that that intensify the effects that I'm going to talk about. So I you know, make reference to Bolivia as a great example of what happened. The government of Bolivia had a lot of state enterprises that were producing sort of primary uh, materials like uh, tin and copper and oil. And in the, around 1982, 83, these prices started to fall. Okay, so the, the, money, the money pump went dry. Uh, the tax revenues for the Bolivian government started to disappear, so they had to they had to get the central bank to lend them some money to pay their workers because they had all these workers in the coal mines and in the, in the tin mines and the copper mines. And over the next five years, this announced policy became very acute. So these are like we have a peak of about 14,000% per annum. That's pretty high. It's pretty high inflation. You know, it's, prices are really increasing you know, every day by 10 at the, at the peak, five, ten percent per day. So you really, you, know, you have to keep your eye on the ball. If you, if you, I don't know about you, but I forget to do things. And you know, if you forget to spend your money a couple of days, you're actually a, a poor person. You've lost something. And you see this reflected in the government surplus, which is the minus of the deficit. Okay, so the surplus kind of was always kind of uh, negative, but around 1983 it really collapsed. Actually, between 1981 and 1983, it started to drop. And you can associate this with certain state-run enterprises, but also the government, the populist kind of government, spending more money, and it's tough, right? That's the problem with having a government-run economy is the government becomes beholden to the voters, and they do things, they make mistakes. So money growth grew fast, okay? Inflation grew fast. We have a hyperinflation. So I'm... Let's just take Turkey as another example. Turkey is a very interesting case. If you want to find out about inflation for an open economy, look at the exchange rate. So this is not a lie. This is real data. This is the Turkish lira since 1960. Okay? So it's, you need a microscope to see how many dollars you could buy um, or how much a dollar cost in terms of lira back then compared to, to lira right now. So if you go to Turkey as a tourist, you might pay you know, um, you might get one to six, a one to five, okay, but there was a time when it was uh, much more favorable. So how would you learn more about this picture? What's your gut feeling? Anybody? Remember, this is the Kagan model. Good, take logs, who said that? <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Take logs, because this ain't gonna tell you anything. You can compute growth rates, but it, I mean, just take logs and then plot it and see what happens. And look what happens. Look how different that picture is. So Turkey, you think Turkey's in trouble. Turkey ain't in trouble, not yet. But if you look over the past, the, the 25 years between 1975 and 2000, they had inflation, okay? And a constant slope means pretty much constant inflation. Remember, take logs, time on the horizontal. So we got down here, just take that slope 
and you get about 154% per annum over that period. Okay, so since then, the Turks have done a great job controlling their inflation rate. Now, this is the dollar Turkish lira, but you can imagine that's correlated with the price level. When you get that kind of depreciation, uh, you're not going to buy much from the United States or from any other country unless you get a decent exchange rate. So the exchange rate is going to have to, is tracking the price evolution for traded goods. So the, the Turks have had, you know, this is the gold standard when everyone had to, had to give up their monetary policy to the authority, to the IMF, basically. And then we had the chaos after Bretton Woods, and then the Turks were actually pretty well behaved, and then all of a sudden, boom, they discovered the printing press. And, uh, and then for a long time they did that, and then they got under control again, but now look what's happening now. And this is not, this is not totally a jour, okay? So I don't have the most recent data, so I have a feeling that you know, there's a bit of a risk because they've had some problems, as you know. Uh, there's always this pressure. The central bank is supposed to be independent now, but maybe they're not. Okay, and inflation still looks pretty good. So people in Turkey still don't believe that this is gonna, we're gonna go back to the 1970s or 1980s uh, because inflation is actually, you can see it was very high. Uh, the scale is, is 100 here, 100% 100 per annum. It's okay, so uh, but now, that they were able to get their action, and Turkey's growing, so GDP is growing, Y is growing. All these are good, good signs. So up until 2016, until recently, things were pretty good. Now, if you take the most recent data, you see a little bit of a spike, okay? So people are concerned about that. Keep your eye on Turkey, it's a very important country. This is also kind of interesting. This is the budget deficit. So you can see that they were actually doing exactly what I, what I talked about, and then suddenly these data are missing. <laughs> so I don't even know what they are. Um, who knows? Um, maybe you know somebody who can help you. Okay, so let's summarize. Fiscal deficits are important. They drive the central bank to issue uh, means of payment to give the government the ability to pay its bills, and that means that um, it can also be financing wars, it could be financing a, a disaster, maybe there was some sort of flood or something. So central banks have a useful function. They can, it's like a backstop for serious financial crisis, right? Financial crisis is another good example. One explanation of this picture with Turkey, by the way, might actually be the financial crisis. Um, this one. This is coinciding with the financial crisis. These are very large deficits. <laughs> so there must have been something going on there that no one has talked about. Um, good, so let's now take the Kagan model and crank it up one notch more. So I apologize, this is the last time you're gonna see this, but I think you should see it, it's kind of neat. Okay, so I'm gonna, Kagan model in continuous time. So you know, you're, you're smart enough now, you know there's a continuous time world, and I spared you the misery of Sodrowski. Sodrowski is, the, is what I was tortured with when I was in graduate school. Sodrowski is the ultimate model, it's like taking Ramsey and putting money into the Ramsey model. Now that's a cool model, okay? But it's hard, it's hard to play with. I don't want you to do that. But slice off a part of the, 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 uh, the, the Sadrowski model and you can actually get the logic of the Kagan model in continuous time. That's what we're gonna do right now. You can see how the government deficit actually can cause uh, hyperinflation, actually collapse of the system. Okay, so let's go back and have money market equilibrium. This is a continuous time model, so now we have T is a continuous number, okay? And in the long run, we always get it right, so people don't make consistent mistakes. That would be kind of crazy. Um, I'm gonna keep output growth at zero, so we ignore GDP. It's all about money growth and inflation, okay? And I'm gonna use this spe specification. This was Kagan's function. Kagan used the exponential raise to this. If you take logs, you get exactly a constant elasticity semi-elasticity of money demand equal to, to eta. Okay, so that's, I'm just repeating what we had before, except now we're in continuous time, and now we're gonna just, we're gonna show how mu actually is driven by the deficit. Okay, so I'm gonna try to connect mu, which is the, is the, the central bank's uh, balance sheet, if you like, in a simple model, it's just the balance sheet, uh, which is you know, responding to the government deficit. Central bankers are just being forced. This is what's called a fiscal dominant model. 
Instead of a monetary dominant, the central banks are tough. Now the central banks are weak and the, the fiscal authority is dominant. So the fiscal authority drives the, the growth of the money supply. Okay? So let's, let's play with this. Let's take logarithms of the Kagan function and we get that. And then we can differentiate with respect to time because we're in continuous time now, so it's not differences, we're differentiating. So, you know, the, the derivative of ln of x is equal to one over x times dx dt. Think of that as the rate divided by the level, okay? And if you do that, you get the rate of growth of the real money supply is a race between the nominal money growth rate and the inflation rate. It's equal to the change of the inflation rate that's expected. So the whole dynamic of the real money supply over time is a function of how the expected rate of inflation changes. So we, need to, we need to model that. Is it rational expectations or is it some sort of adaptive? So Kagan, as I said, Kagan thought adaptive. Okay, uh, but before we do that, I'm gonna talk about how the government forces the central bank to print money. And then we're done. So the deficit is what matters. And the deficit is equal to the government budget defined as the government spending uh, per unit time, government spending per unit of time in real terms minus the tax revenues in real terms. In nominal terms, you have to multiply it by P. Okay, so that's the, this is the real deficit. And then you have to, to get the nominal deficit, you have to multiply it by the price level. That's, that's an easy one, okay? So when I multiply P times the real deficit, I get the government forcing the central bank to create money. And this is outside money. Okay, so this is, DMDT is the rate of change, not as a rate, but as an absolute amount per unit time, the change of the money supply per unit time as a function of the government deficit in nominal terms. So think about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting paid by the government. The government gives me a check that they just force the, the Bundesbank to print to pay me. Okay, that's literally what's happening in this model. There's no tax, there's no tax revenue outside this T, which is supposedly exogenous. So again, Tanzi, the famous Italian, said that even T is not exogenous because people get scared of inflation. They stop paying taxes. Um, they just run away from the, the, the fiscal authorities. Whatever fine they get doesn't matter because they can save money paying back in deflated uh, money, devalued money, okay? So if you just take that and manipulate it, you can see that the money supply, the money demand, sorry, the money supply is growing just by dividing by M on both sides and manipulating a little bit. The rate of growth of money depends on the real deficit relative to the real money that's held in the economy. So it's a ratio of the deficit to the demand for money, and that's a real quantity, and we already know what determines that. That's determined by people's expectations of the future price level, their inflationary expectations. So you can see this thing looks very unstable. If people start expecting lots of inflation, this is gonna go down. The denominator goes down means this quotient goes up, so the government has to print even more money. Okay, so that's the instability of the, of the Kagan inflation dynamic. Okay, so people, people start getting nervous, like in Bulgaria, they think the government's gonna print money in the future. Inflation's gonna be high in the future, they hold less money today, the price level goes up. Um, and relative to a, a constant deficit in real terms, the government's financing needs at the central bank will grow, and that's a growth rate. So that's a determinant of, of long run rate of, of growth of the money supply. Okay, so the thing looks really, so this is the other equation in our model, in the Kagan model. Because the, if there is a steady state, if a steady state exists, it has to be such that the monetary growth rate equals the inflation rate. That's an imposed condition for a steady state. Okay, so that kind of restricts the choices this model can give you, especially in the long run, but also in the, in the terms of the dynamics. So the real deficit determines the inflation rate, and the inflation rate is the inflation tax. There's no, you know, there's a, you can think of inflation as being a tax on the money you hold. Think of those poor people who got paid in Weimar Germany, you know, 
uh, 50 you know, billion um, Reichsmark at the beginning of the month, and at the end of the month, inflation might have been 150, 50% inflation. That means that the purchasing power of that stack of, of banknotes was less. So you can think about that creation of money long run leading to a tax on the existing stock of monetary instruments out there, okay? So a lot of times inflation is called an, is a tax, it is a tax, obviously, but in the long run, it's also related to the rate of growth of money. Okay, so it's the rate of dilution, if you like. Okay, so it's a it's this kind of race between the government real budget deficit and this demand for balances. So you can see that again, the secret for Bolivia um, to, to fight inflation uh, back in uh, 1984. So I'm, this is going to be on YouTube. So I'm I'm really happy. To, to, to tell this story because I never had a chance to tell this in public. So my thesis advisor was Jeffrey Sachs, who's a really prominent guy, but back then he was impossible to find. So he was like the worst possible thesis advisor you could imagine. So, I mean, people say that about me, but they don't know what I had to go through, <laughs> okay? So Jeffrey Sachs was advising the government of Bolivia. So every few weeks he would fly from Cambridge, Massachusetts to, to Bogota, um, and advise their finance minister. They wanted to make him finance minister at one point. He was telling them what they should do to get their hyperinflation under control. And Jeff was clever because he understood that it's about expectations. No gold anymore. People don't use gold. The government deficit is hard to get down. So you know, he told them, look, if you really want to stop inflation, you're going to have to cut the public sector and you're also gonna to have to do it in a credible way because if you just cut the public sector today, people won't believe you're gonna cut it in the future. So what he did is he actually got the IMF to agree to a fixed exchange rate. I gave them a loan to support a, a devalued dollar um, peso exchange rate that had a very, very slow rate of increase and you know, it was credible only because the IMF was standing behind it and they cut the budget deficit. So that was enough to get people to to raise their willingness to hold the new money and that reduced the government's financing needs. So it was like a virtuous circle. The same thing happened in Weimar, Germany in 1923-24. Jalmar Schacht uh, basically said, look, you gotta cut this deficit and we're gonna have to change the operating procedure. We're gonna have to insulate the central bank from the pressures of the government. So the government can't just knock on the door and say, finance this deficit. Okay, and that's another reason why it's good to have an ECB because the German government can't force the ECB to finance their deficit. And the, presumably the Greeks can't do it either. Right, so that's the, that's the interesting aspect of that. So if we think about it, that means that the, the rate of growth of the nominal money supply uh, is given by the deficit. The rate of growth of real balances is given by the expression I just put up on, on the first part of the slide. So, Change of, of the real balance of real balances is a function of the race between money growth and inflation. And we know that because of the financing requirements on the central bank imposed by the government, the second equation has to hold. So we can just insert those and we get the following equation. The, the real, real balances change over time depending on a, the difference between the, the government deficit, which is real, because it's pumping money into the economy and people's willingness uh, to hold money. And that's, a, that's basically a function of the inflation tax times the amount of real balances people are holding. Okay, so that race is gonna give rise to a fairly interesting dynamic. And, it all, and again, it all depends on the future because this, this pi t is looking into the future. Every, even if it's, even, even in continuous time, you're looking at the next little increment of time. That's gonna determine your your expected inflation. It's not, a, it's not looking backwards, it's looking forward. Okay? So now all we have to do is, is, is figure out how people's expectations change, because that's the key. Right? Once we, once, we've, once we get that, we have two equations and two unknowns, and we can, we can solve, uh, or we can just substitute. So this is, the, this is the crux of macroeconomics today. And after this, we're going to do very different things. It's all about expectations. Expectations determine your behavior. So that's kind of a general statement, but especially in monetary matters, expected inflation um, going into the future depends, pe determines people's behavior today, okay? 
So let's, let's do it. Okay, so long run we know, short run, you know, we can talk, later on I'll tell you, Professor Weinke will tell you, uh, marginal costs are important for firms, they set prices, uh, expectations of future inflation, I talked about already, these expectations affect everything, um, but we still have to take a stand on whether people are stupid or not. Are they stupid in the sense of they're just backward looking and they're just kind of like robots, or do they actually try to anticipate what the government is trying to do to them? Because the government's doing a lot to them right now. They're running a deficit and they're printing money and fooling people. If they hold money, they, have to, they just lose purchasing power every instant. Um, it's not such a great deal for them. So maybe they'll try to second guess what the government's doing. So Kagan assumed people were kind of stupid. Okay, not, I mean, he had to start somewhere. So we call that adaptive expectations. So that's just saying that the, the rate of the change, the change with respect to time, um, which is why you have a dot on top, of people's expectations, and expectations do not have to equal the actual inflation. Okay, that's something we can impose, but we don't have to. Uh, basically, Kagan just said people adjust. So beta is a positive number, and if you're really far off, you'll adjust your inflationary expectations quickly, but if you're close, you're not gonna adjust so much. Okay, so that's kind of what he assumes. It's called adaptive, exp it's, it looks a lot like what we, we tend to do in real life. Like, so it snows this afternoon, you know, I say, well, it's kind of warm today, it's not gonna stick, okay? But maybe it snows again and again, and three days later, all these people are saying, man, I should get my, it's really gonna be cold. And then the next week, and we have snow on the ground, it's all chunky and slushy and cold. So we, we change our expectations as we move through time. That's kind of a, a it's almost a rational way of behaving. And if you do that, you can plug that equation into the equation I had before, and you get inflation as a function of that. It's just the Kagan equation. But then we substitute it, and we see that it depends on how far we are away. So as, we, as we're, if we're very far away, if we really got it wrong, then we're gonna adjust our inflation expectations a lot, and that's gonna reduce um, our demand for money. It's gonna increase the inflation rate, okay? So for stability, we're gonna require that this thing is true. So in the long run, we need, we need this thing to be positive, and that's what Kagan assumed in his paper. Um, people don't react too much. They're not like, like absolute, you know, super sensitive. Um, and that's gonna guarantee some sort of stability. And here's how you can draw that picture. So it's a little bit like we had before, except now we have, the ch we have the change in expectations on the vertical, and we have the level of expectations on the horizontal. We know we're gonna be at, at the green dot in the steady state when people get it right. Question is, how do we get there? How do we get there, okay? So if, if we really, if we, um, if we really got it wrong before, inflationary expectations are gonna, are gonna if we, we over-expected inflation, inflationary expectations will decline to the, to the zero point. If we really got it wrong in the negative direction, inflationary expectations are gonna rise. Um, I think I got it backwards. So this is positive, this is negative. So if, it's, if we're above, that means inflationary expectations are adjusting in the positive direction, so we're catching up. That would be here, excuse me. And then from below, inflationary expectations would be declining. Okay, so in the steady state, we're, uh, we're getting it right. Pi t is equal to pi e t. Okay, as we're moving forward. Of course, we'll never, in this model, we'll never actually get there. It's like, it's like in, the, in the Ramsey model, we'll just, we'll approach asymptotically and we can get arbitrarily close to that point. So that's how Kagan tried to explain what happened in Germany and in Hungary and Italy in those, okay? So people criticize that and say, well, you're, you're assuming people are dumb, right? Because people are losing resources along the way. Maybe they should try to get ahead of the game. They see, like in Bulgaria, they see this happening. They, they look behind the curtain. They see people getting ready to print money. Then they should start reducing their demand for money right now, right? That's the, the logic of, of the Kagan model. So Sergeant and Wallace, Sergeant, Nobel Prize, Wallace, very prominent uh, money monetary theorist, they said, let's take the other extreme. Let's assume people are, are hyper smart and they nail it. So like in the OLG model, they understand everything. So it's like the other extreme, okay? This is not the same thing as rational expectations. Rational expectations is weaker. It's 
less strict. But it's still kind of interesting. And it also shows if people are smart enough to take this course, or maybe even not that smart, uh, they can still get ahead of the game. They're not going to act like robots like in the other case. Okay. Well, then it gets complicated. Okay, because if people get it right, that means that inflation has to move along the Kagan money demand curve. Okay, so we're, we're constrained to be there in, the, um, in this model. And we also have to worry about people's knowing that the government is financing the, the deficit using the printing press, which is this e equation. Okay, so it turns out there's not, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in this model. If you put them together, you end up getting potential equilibria that are either stable or unstable. Okay, so the one that's on the upper left is actually saddle stable, and the one at the bottom is, is unstable. Okay, so if people have perfect foresight, this is the only place they can be effectively. And this equilibrium is not going to be stable. Because this is kind of a, a dire prediction of the model. So you can see what would happen if the government suddenly starts to credibly increase the deficit like they did in Zimbabwe or in Bolivia uh, or Weimar Germany. And you have a move of this, this one blue curve before, after. Okay, there's, no, there's not even a guarantee you'll get an intersection. So one explanation of or one because we actually observe hyperinflation, uh, the inflation rate is rising so fast, we can't even explain it using the model. So apparently people have kind of lost complete, complete faith in, the, in any sort of existent equilibrium. Otherwise, it would be up here somewhere. Okay? So you can see that inflation can jump very quickly uh, in a normal situation. And if the model uh, changes dramatically, um, things can change dramatically. Okay, so this is one account for hyperinflation. So how do people's expectations really work? Are they this, this extreme in the case of perfect foresight? Certainly not, but they're probably also not perfectly adaptive. It's probably a mix. People are using some sort of learning about the future by observing the past and forming some sort of um, pseudo or semi or maybe even rational expectation where they just try to correct their mistakes. Okay, so you can get a, a fairly robust um, conclusion that would point to this type of equilibrium um, with some adjustment over time. Okay, so I'm going I'm to spend the last three minutes talking about macroeconomic dynamic, dynamics because you can see that the dynamics in that picture are quite complicated. They depend on people's expectations and the steady state is not really that interesting. What's more interesting is how we get there. Um, and when you think about politics, people's getting upset about the recession or the boom, uh, the bust. It's about the short run and the interaction of people's expectations um, and how they affect inflation and output. So this is how I want to motivate the rest of the course. Okay, we need, we need to think about how variables change in the short run. Part of that will be about how people's expectations change over time. So we're going to think about ways to, to do this. I'm going to start easy because I know a lot of you have taken economics as bachelors and you've had maybe a little bit less uh, rigorous approach to this. So I'm going to start with, a, with something that you can take with you for the rest of your life. And then I'm going to move into, a, into the more complicated mode. Okay? Uh, I'm going to talk about the, um, the aggregate supply, aggregate demand framework. And to get there, I'm going to talk about how people started thinking about this because this is a great example of how economists can also be inductive in the way they reason. So the previous model was, an, was a deductive model. I wrote down a, some first principles. In the OLG model, we had utility maximization, single asset, two generations. In the Kagan model, we had a money demand function, which is kind of a theoretical construct that we can derive. And then we derive the implications. That's deductive thinking here. Um, economics also can be inductive, so we can look at the data. Um, and the Phillips curve is a relationship between inflation and unemployment. It's an empirical relationship. There is very little theory a priori that generates that Phillips curve. We can put theory on the table and we can discuss it, but you'll, ha you'll see that basically this inductive discovery of A.W. Phillips was kind of a, a breakthrough for us, and we still use it. We, we use a modified Phillips curve even today. So there's my man, A.W. 
Where was this guy from? He was from the land of the Hobbit. <laughs> so this guy was the most exotic uh, per person you could imagine. I mean, he was a sheep farmer uh, in New Zealand, Australia. He o operated a cinema. He went crocodile hunting in Australia. And then he went to study engineering in the UK. Okay, it's kind of interesting. Um, before that, he was in the army and was captured by the Japanese and spent three and a half years in a POW camp, which is not pleasant. He went to England, got his PhD in economics, and became a member of the Order of the British Empire. So he did something that was important, like you know, Mick Jagger or Sting or something. You get one of these, you know. Miles Davis. <laughs> OK, so he, his, his credit his uh, contribution is that he discovered the Phillips curve, okay? And it's an empirical relationship, and it's kind of interesting to think about. I just want to get you thinking about it for next week, okay? If you read his paper, he was very careful. He actually criticized himself in the paper. He actually said, you know, we should be very careful not to take this and put it right to the data and use policy. And back then, they didn't know what the Lucas critique was, but he actually kind of understood that. He was an engineer. Okay, so he had good, good examples of engineering. And to prove that, he invented the Moniac. Okay, so if you guys go to England, or go, to, go to London, uh, take a look at this. It's in, the, it's in the British Museum. It's unbelievably interesting, okay? This is the Moniac. <laughs> this, is a, this is something that economists do, okay? <laughs> but only an economist who's an engineer can do this. This is a depiction of the national income and product accounts using fluids. Okay, so fluids running through tubes, G plus C plus I plus X minus Z equals GDP, taxes, transfers. And that thing ran in real time and actually was a, as a model of the economy. So Phillips was a pretty smart guy. And I have to tell this story. When I, was a, when I had just finished my PhD and I was at the LSE visiting the London School of Economics, this machine was in a storage room. And one of the professors there said, hey, Michael, you want to come check out the Lemoniac? And I said, well, I didn't know what that is. So they, had this, they, had, they couldn't figure out where to put this thing because nobody wanted it. Finally, the, the museum took it. But um, I saw this thing, OK? It, it did exist. And in the 1960s, it was a big hit, OK? So they, uh, this guy, Phillips, designed this thing. And you can see, there he is. There's Phillips. He's smoking a cigarette, um, showing how this thing works. And it, was, it made several magazines in, in the UK and uh, kind of inspiring people to think about how the GDP account, accounts work. But Phillips got his, you know, his big contribution was, was this paper in 1958, where he looked at the rate of growth of wages, nominal wages, nominal, OK, in the UK between 1861, it took a lot of data gathering to get this, 1861 to 1913, just before World War I, and plotted them against unemployment in the UK. OK, so you can see it's, it looks like a negative relationship, and it looks not linear. It looks kind of log linear. Okay, so if you, if you want, I'll, put the, I'll post that paper. You can take a look at it. Um, this relationship I'll show next week was the missing link between the nominal on the one hand and the real on the other. Because economists up until 1957, 58, were struggling to find out how to connect Keynes, who assumed prices were constant, with something we saw happening that I just showed you happened all over the world, which is prices go up. So this is one kind of key of way of finding out how the real economy interacts with the nominal economy. OK? So I hope you have a nice week. And if you have time, come on tomorrow on Wednesday and see me. Ciao.